Having grown up in Wisconsin, a veteran of the Navy, uh, my family embraced being American first and realized that they were Americans that happened to be Muslim, happened to be Arabic, happened to be of Syrian descent. And that ultimately this country allowed them the place and the, and the ability to practice their faith better than any of the Muslim majority countries that make up the organization of the Islamic cooperation. And many of these principles were from our founding fathers, the Jeffersonian principles that embody our constitution and especially our first amendment that protects and enshrines religious liberty. And they escaped two evils in the Middle East that we see now sort of alternating between, which is the Arab, the the Arab uh, monarchs and dictators or autocrats and then the theocrats or the Islamists. And uh, for a long time in my life I pushed back against uh, many of the Islamist groups that uh, seemed to have followed us to America and uh, that really came to America not to embrace liberty but rather to evangelize the Islamist, the political Islamic movement which really envisions countries not run by Quranic law as they interpret it or clerics interpret it as a threat to their agenda across the world. And I think ultimately today what the Arab awakening has brought for us is a realization that most of us Muslims figured out a hundred years ago, which was that political Islam is a threat to freedom. And that the only solution to that is countries that have figured out, as our founding fathers did, which is how to celebrate religious freedom, public protection of religious practice, separate from theocracy. And it's really that same battle that our founding fathers forged, not bloodlessly, but with revolutions and with large reform movements in the West, is now being waged in a much more accelerated fashion because of social media across the Muslim world. I used to take on the groups before 9-11, the Muslim Student Association, the Islamic Society of North America and others internally, and after 9-11, as KT mentioned, um, many of us took this to a whole new level and realized that we can't just do this generationally, but that the world can't wait. That Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and now we've seen Fort Hood, the Boston bombing, on and on, this problem is not gonna go away. The symptoms continue to show themselves and the disease within is not violence, but rather an ideology that looks at the West, modernity, as a threat to them, which is Islamism or political Islam. And to this day, you know, and I would say, while President Bush, Bush 43, was better at this uh, than our current uh, uh, White House, both really were not able to articulate what we're fighting against. That this isn't a war against terror. This is, this is a battle for the hearts and minds, not only hearts and minds, but a battle for individualism, for freedom, against theocracy, against really political Islam. And what I want to leave you with in my few minutes is that not only is there hope, but we as conservatives need to begin to understand and engage with the head of the spear, which are Muslims that believe in a society not run by the theocracy and not run by Sharia and government, where faith practice is personal and government doesn't coerce it, and the men, and the men with robes don't tell us how to practice our faith, and that ultimately we can decide on our own. And unfortunately, or uh, uh, which would have been obvious, the left has had a huge blind spot because of their collectivism. They've had a blind spot from the feminist movement, from the gay rights movements, and others who are clearly attacked in Muslim majority countries and have no rights, but yet they ignore these things. And we in the conservative movement have not, I believe, been able to articulate who our friends are and who our enemies are when it comes to Muslim majority countries. And unfortunately what's happened is we allow the Islamists to identify, whether it's neocons or however you want to describe them, to identify us as being quote-unquote Islamophobic, when in fact that couldn't be further from the truth. We just don't want to get in the business of other people's religion. So the solution though is not, I believe, isolationism. The, the country that my parents and our families came to embrace was one that really stood as that city on the hill that was the protector of freedom and liberty. And I think we're learning very quickly through this administration what happens when there's a vacuum. And nature abhors a vacuum and it's getting filled by dictators, kleptocrats, and also Islamists. So the Arab awakening which has presented numerous opportunities for change and true reform has now been 
become an Islamist winter. And I give you one example. There are many that say, well, the American Islamic Forum for Democracy and many Muslims like me are simply mutations, that Islam is, is the problem and we're never going to fix that. Uh, we're not mutations. The, the Egyptians proved last June when you had 10 million Egyptians in the street protesting the Muslim Brotherhood government. They did not want theocracy, they did not want Sharia law and government, and these were majority Muslims that came to the street. So one year of, of an open society, post-dictatorship, did more to defeat the ideas of Islamism than 60 years of Nasser Sadat and Mubarak. And, and I guess the message there is clearly we're not going to win this militarily, but we're also not going to win it by avoiding and just sort of getting the popcorn and watching this, what I would call the current doctrine in the Middle East, is a Darwin doctrine where we just sort of let the most evil win. And, and we see that those with the power and the money and the military are going to win. The liberals are looking at us now even worse than they were. People thought that somehow America would be loved if we pulled out of Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and the polls have proven that to be completely false. And that was a false narrative in our very isolated partisan politics here in America that we missed the boat that the reason we aren't loved is we have different values that we promote at home than we do abroad. That the liberals, the classical liberals in Syria and Egypt and Iraq are being abandoned by many of us. And I hope ultimately as we get together in conferences like this we realize that we need a strategy over the next 3, 5, 10, 25 years that engages those Muslim groups that believe in liberty that are bold enough, like we have a coalition that we've formed called the American Islamic Leadership Coalition that includes over 20 organizations in the West that are countering, taking on Muslim Brotherhood groups, Jamaat Islamiyya, uh, all of those ideological groups that are fueling the Islamist movements across the world that are part of the 56 organizations of Islamic cooperation states. We are trying to do what we can at a fraction of the fuel and energy that that our antagonists have. And our antagonists, they claim, some of them claim to be on our side, like Qatar and Saudi Arabia, that now, oddly, we, we're revisiting this term of calling them allies. When Qatar spends half a billion dollars on Al Gore's network, this is not an issue of isolationism anymore. They're in our shores. They're, they're broadcasting in our family rooms about political Islamist ideas, negativity towards Americanism, and the goal of the Islamists, make no mistake, they're not going to, you know, one percent of Muslims in America aren't going to take over the government. The, their goal is to make us isolation. Their goal is to make us pull out of their countries so that they can spend the billions to advance theocracy and defeat liberty and defeat the ideas of reform that actually created Americanism and American exceptionalism that I believe are the ideas that many of our families came to celebrate. So as we look at 2017 and, and in America, what's America's role post-Obama? I hope that we in the conservative movement can begin to have as part of our platform a litmus test for Islamism. That we say if you, if you believe in the Islamic State, even if you're a free marketeer and, and uh, um, toe the line on low taxes and other things, if, if you endorse or apologetic or can't articulate that the Islamic State and Islamism and Sharia and government is a threat to our way of life, then you're not a conservative. Then you don't really adhere to the principles of our founding fathers that fought the same struggle against theocracy. And until we have that, we're going to continue to have the security threat that creates the Nidal Hassans. You're going to continue to have a media that bends over backwards in apologetics and political correctness that won't discuss it. And you're going to continue to alienate and distance the very Muslims like myself and others that need to be at the head of the spear in fighting for reform within. I, I wrote a book that I'll leave you with. It's called The Battle for the Soul of Islam. And basically, that's what it is. They, those powers that be want it to appear that this is Islam versus the West, versus Christianity, and that's a religious battle. This is a battle within Islam. And right now, the good guys and gals are losing. The feminists, the liberals that are on our side, the secularists, however you want to call them, the non-Islamists right now, are shifting towards socialism, towards other things away from Islamism, and they're not shifting towards classical liberty. And I think if we can get our act together, and just as Reagan constantly in every press conference identified that not only was the Soviets a problem, 
communism was a problem, socialism was a problem, all those ideas that swam in the same pool as Soviet theory. Similarly, when we're fighting the Al-Qaeda's and the Islamists, we need leadership in Washington post-2016 that can articulate that Muslim liberals are our allies, Muslim Islamists are the greatest threat to mankind in the next 21st, in this 21st century. So join us, we have a Muslim Liberty Project, we have coalitions that we're forming that are testifying to Congress, trying to shake the trees that until we can have a consensus in conservatives and in America that we need to have a, a, a succinct way of identifying how Islamism is the main problem, we're not going to get any headway now, 13 years post 9-11, and any headway in making good friends with those who are on our side and that the Middle East isn't stuck in this death match between two evils. There is a third front in Syria, there is a third front in Egypt, there is a third front in Iraq. The problem is we've just been missing in action, so thank you.